Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day two of Witham's annual business and finance symposium. Uh, glad to have everyone back and uh, happy to be here on day two, providing some ANA update CPE credits for y'all. Um, always fun to engage with clients and, and friends of the firm in, in this venue. Um, uh, my name is Jared Wren. I'm a partner in our technical resources department. Um, I'm here with Ben Davenport. We're going to be your tour guides for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so, walking through some a, &A updates. Uh, we have a pretty fun agenda sorted out for you, uh, covering a wide variety of topics. Uh, hopefully, you know many or at least some of them will be applicable to your daily life. Um, and with that, let's let's move on. I don't know, Ben, if you want to give a quick introduction um, of yourself before we jump into some of our learning objectives. Yeah, and I'm uh, thanks, thanks, Jared. I'm Ben, and I'm an associate principal in the TR group, and uh, I've been working on quarterly updates, uh, ANA updates with the firm with Jared for the past year or so, and so excited to do a kind of an annual update here for for all of you. All right, thanks. Let's take a look at our learning objectives. Um, so today we're going to be covering uh, accounting and financial reporting um, topics. So these are largely coming from the, the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Um, we're going to walk through um, several of their recently effective standards and, and some other things that are uh, uh, likely forthcoming. Um, but that let's let's take a look at our agenda. So. Uh, we do have the FASB accounting update, so we're going to look at things that were recently effective, trying to focus on some things that are most relevant um, to this particular audience. Uh, then we're going to shift into looking at some um, ASUs. Those are accounting standards updates that are soon to be effective for calendar year-end reporting. And then finally, we're going to take a peek at some things that are on the FASB's technical agenda to get a sense of where the standard setters are are moving, um, they do have you know we're, we're coming off a period of some uh, you know quite large standards that have been rolling out over the past few years, you know starting with uh, RevRec and leases and then Cecil most recently those are kind of like really benchmark standards, um, and then they kind of cooled down a little bit in more recent uh, months and and maybe the past year or so. But there are some exciting things on the agenda, which I think are going to be relatively impactful for many of our clients. So we're going to be excited to talk about those. Um, so let's move in first to the uh, the FASB accounting standards um, updates. These are recently issued. Um, they did release uh, seven final ASUs since uh, fourth quarter of last year. So we're going to cover the substantive updates and maybe focusing on ones that are hopefully most applicable to this group. Um, so you see the ones here with the asterisks. Uh, those are the ones we're going to be covering a little bit more uh, in, in depth here today. Uh, let's, let's take a look at, um, this is uh, ASU 2023-07. So just Fun fact in the nomenclature here, when when we have on screen or I refer to, you know, 23-07. Um, so 2023 is the year that it was released and then they just put them in sequence. So dash uh, 07 is the seventh update that was issued in that particular year. So, you know, 2307, as we call it, um, it does apply to segment reporting. Um, so we are kind of taking these in, in largely chronological order. Uh, but the ASU here covers um, all public entities that are required to report segment um, disclosures in accordance with topic um, 280. Um, so this is effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2023, and for interim periods um, starting with uh, those after December 15th of 24. Um, so they always phrase it this way for periods beginning after December 15th. So that just for, uh, you know, uh, most practical purposes, this is going to apply to um, fiscal years beginning January 1st, 2024 and ending December of 24. And then interim reporting starts in Q1 of 2025. Um, so we won't spend a lot of time on this because this is a public company reporting matter. Um, but it does it does change pretty meaningfully uh, the segment reporting obligations, particularly those with 
um, singular reporting segments. Um, so the significant segment expenses uh, that the new ASU covers, um, it, we need to be focusing on what is regularly provided to the, the CODM. So that's the chief operating decision maker in the segment parlance. Um, we also need to be dis disclosing the amounts for other segment items by reportable segment and a description of its components. So sort of a breakdown of what those uh, line items consist of. And then uh, at least one reported measure of segment profit or loss that is most consistent with U.S. GAAP um, must be used if, if there's more than one that's in play for that chief operating decision maker. So not surprisingly, the standards are kind of reverting back and looking to well, what is the, the closest profitability metric that aligns with the U.S. GAAP concept. Um, and that's the one that really should be focused on. Um, so maybe a lighter touch for um, all of our private companies. Uh, not many private companies would choose to do segment reporting. Um, to the extent you are, uh, then this guidance would be in scope. Um, so moving on to maybe my favorite overall topic for the 2023 suite of ASUs is the accounting for um, crypto assets. Um, so the accounting for crypto assets has been getting a tremendous amount of attention from uh, companies and the standard setters alike. There was a lot of feedback coming from preparers and users of statements ab about how the, the, the historical approach to crypto assets was kind of fitting into the FASB's framework. Uh, because under the previous guidance, these crypto assets are classified as indefinite live intangibles. Um, so this means they would be recorded at cost. And the only recognition of a change in value would be impairment. So if the impairment would create a new cost basis, um, you know, so uh, it starts with the cost of what you pay and then less impairment charges at any point after it's been acquired. Um, and as we know, the way we deal with um, intangible assets and impairment is that once impaired, you don't then bring that value back up. It's it's only downward adjustments under the under the existing um, intangible asset framework. Um, so no reversals of that impairment charge, regardless of the fair value changes of that crypto asset. Um, so a lot of companies also reported that the impairment testing itself created complexity in their reporting process. Uh, we found that there was a large diversity in how some companies were applying that impairment guidance. Um, and so what the FASB did in 23-08, um, they, they endeavored to address a lot of these changes. Um, I mean, I will say it's, it's hard to under underemphasize the impact of this ASU on companies that deal in crypto assets. Uh, there was a large consensus that the in intangible asset model really was disconnected from the economics of the a, a crypto asset. Um, so let, let's move on to the next slide. We're going to take a look at um, what is going to change here. So um, the new guidance um, changes pretty dramatically the reporting model. Uh, so under the new rules, the crypto assets would be measured at fair value with periodic changes in value recognized in net income each reporting period. So think mark to market accounting for the crypto assets. Um, some additional clarity uh, for transaction costs, such as you know, things like commissions or other related transaction fees would be recognized as expense um, when incurred, um, unless there's applicable industry specific guidance that would allow capitalization of those costs and, and those would largely be um, somewhat rare in practice. Um, so a pretty wholesale change to what the reporting framework um, would look like. Let's jump ahead. I think one more slide here, Ben. Thanks. Uh, the amendments would also require that companies present crypto assets separately from other intangible assets on the balance sheet and that changes in fair value of these assets shown separately from changes in the carrying amounts of other intangible assets on the income statement. Um, so there is there isn't a lot of guidance in US GAAP on things like how an asset is grouped on your balance sheet or how um, uh, 
a, a charge or an expense on your income statement is presented. So this is some, I think, welcome clarity to, to many in the financial reporting process. Um, and what this ASU um, serves to clarify is that you know crypto assets are they're different economically than your other intangible assets, whether they be goodwill or you know acquired IP R and D. If you have things that came from business combinations, you know a, a crypto asset has very different economic characteristics, and there sh therefore should be segregated from those other intangible assets on the face of your of your balance sheet. And then likewise, there is typically a lack of uh, um, prescriptive guidance on where um, uh, expenses would be reported on your, on your income statement. And what this ASU clarifies is that it just should be reported sort of separately from other changes in the value of your intangible assets. So I would expect there to be a, a discrete line item on your income statement that would call out changes in fair value of crypto assets. So again, a, a pretty welcome change to the reporting framework here. Yeah, Jared, and I was just going to say, I think that point is good as far as intangible assets also that are being amortized, right? And so there's generally the presumption that income statements will have that amortization there, and then you'll have, now have the change in value, um, again, to show the difference in economics. Yeah. Um, so what, let's talk about where this guidance is applied. So on the next slide, we're going to, there is a list of criteria, right? So there was... Um, a fair amount of conversation about, you know, when does it make sense to apply this guidance, right? So um, crypto assets in general is still a, very much an emerging topic. Um, and so we should expect to see further developments in how crypto assets are issued, how they're used, um, so forth and so on. Um, so these six criteria right here um, are required to, uh, to be present, all six, to in order to apply this new standard. Um, so the first, it has to meet the definition of an intangible asset as defined in the master glossary. Um, I don't think that's going to be a high hurdle as you know. previously, um, we didn't see any issues with it falling into the intangible asset definition. Um, a wide variety of crypto assets uh, met that threshold. Um, second is it, it um, cannot or does not provide the asset holder with enforceable rights or claims to goods, services, or other assets. This one is an important limitation, right? Because we have seen many, many cases where it's it might be some sort of token or other uh, other uh, crypto-based asset where it provides the holder the right to use a service, provides them access to a platform, provides them some future um, good. It could be an intangible. Like we've seen Kickstarter type deals where you you buy into the crypto thing and that allows you to acquire or receive um, a product when it become when it comes to market. All that stuff is off the table. So if it provides the holder with rights to any good or service, we're completely outside the scope of the new ASU. So that is going to be a relatively meaningful limiting condition to the ASU. Um, it, it must reside on a distributed ledger based on blockchain technology. It must be secured through cryptography. It must be fungible. And another important distinction and number six here is, is provided to um, limit uh, potential abuse of these new mark to market um, accounting rules. Uh, it cannot be created or issued by the reporting entity or any of its related parties. So. You can't have a company issue their own token or um, crypto asset, and you know it's on their own balance sheet. They issued it, and then you get mark-to-market accounting of it. So it can't do that. It's got to be issued by an unrelated party of the reporting entity for the ASU to apply at all. Um, and again, that one was really more so as um, as a measure to prevent some abuse or some um, uh, unintentional uh, fair value gains and losses that could come from uh, come from uh, applying the new ASU. Um, so let's look uh, and talk about some disclosure matters. So, not surprisingly, the FASB's focus was at least partially on 
um, enhancing and clarifying disclosure. So 2308 requires the companies provide that enhanced disclosure for annual and interim periods. Um, so we're supposed to provide investors or users of the statements with relevant information to analyze and assess the exposure um, to significant individual crypto asset holdings. Um, so we need to disclose the name, the cost basis, the fair value, the number of units for each significant crypto asset holding, uh, and then the aggregate fair value and cost basis for crypto assets that are not individually significant. So sort of a breakout, like, you know, call out your, uh, all the individual items or individual asset holdings that are significant, and then you can kind of bucket the remaining ones into sort of like this other category. Um, and then for crypto assets that are subject to um, legal or contractual sale restrictions, uh, the fair value of those crypto assets, the nature and the remaining duration of the strict the restrictions need to be disclosed and disclose the circumstances that could cause the restrictions to lapse. So kind of general like terms and conditions, if, if you have a limitation on how those assets can be used, um, that's the relevant disclosure that we would need to make. Uh, and then finally, I think we're going to talk about just the the application here. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one more disclosure. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah sure. here, here we go. A mm -hmm. uh, roll forward would also be required to disclose in the aggregate the activity for the holding. So this is not that different than like a typical level three fair value roll forward. Um, so it's just the activity, uh, including like um, additions, sales, dispositions, gains and losses. So just, you know, balance sheet bookends, the activity in the middle would be a required uh, roll forward. Uh, all right, so then, yeah. Okay, so then for any dispositions of the crypto assets in the reporting period, the difference between the disposition price and the cost basis, so like the realized gain or loss would be a relevant disclosure. Um, so that does require that um, records exist to track that cost basis, um, like, very likely required for tax purposes anyway, uh, but that's still gonna be a relevant disclosure um, under this under this new regime. Uh, and then finally, the method for determining the cost, the cost basis um, would be a presumptively required disclosure. All right, so I think my last slide on crypto is the um, effective date. Um, so all entities for fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2024, including interim periods within those fiscal years. Um, so this is basically a, a 2025 issue uh, as a mandatory adoption. The early adoption is permitted for statements not yet issued. Uh, we have worked with uh, many clients in kind of walking with them as they uh, as they adopted the new standard. Um, there are some additional nuances that maybe weren't in scope to our conversation today that are relevant considerations and just how we're going to apply um, some of the standard as far as um, uh, determining the the principal market for the fair value purposes. There's there's lots of details um, that. Uh, an issuer or holder of these instruments should be mindful of as they're adopting the standard. So we have walked through that several times. Um, as far as transition goes, cumulative effect adjustment to opening balance of retained earnings um, should be used, uh, which just means you apply it to the periods that we're presenting, mm -hmm. uh, which I think brings us to the end of our crypto update. It certainly does. So I'll um I'll pick up from the from twenty three oh eight and move into twenty three oh nine, which are improvements to income tax disclosures. Uh, this is an area that the board has been focused on enhancing transparency and decision usefulness of those disclosures, uh, based on feedback and their own um, kind of opinions on what would be helpful in adding um, anytime you see the board wanting to enhance transparency means there's gonna be more disclosures on the horizon. Um, and so we are gonna walk through some of those steps here. Um, the, the main points that the board is looking at with this, this new ASU, this update is to help 
the users of the financials to really understand exposures to different tax jurisdictions and the kind of ensuing risks and opportunities that come from that. They also want users to be able to assess this income tax information to understand how that could impact cash flow forecasts as well as capital allocation decisions. Uh, and finally, to be aware of any potential opportunities for how to increase future cash flows uh, moving forward. So the, the board has come forward and um, issuing this new guidance, they want it to apply to any entity that's subject to income taxes. Um, there are a few differences that we'll outline as we go through where disclosures are going to be only required for public business entities and some disclosures are required for um, non-public entities. So we'll go through that. One of the larger sections of the update uh, has to do with the rate reconciliation. Uh, and so, uh, as you may remember, there's this rate reconciliation would go from statutory rates to effective tax rates. Uh, there's also some changes being made to how to present and disclose um, the income taxes that are paid, um, generally by jurisdiction there. The I, other, I just, oh, yeah, go ahead, Jared. I'm sorry, just to add a little bit of maybe color to the, the FASB's perspective on this one. Um, you know, they did get, a, there was a meaningful amount of feedback from stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, it's, it's users and preparers of, of this, of financial statements, um, that the income tax category of reporting, whether it be the numbers on the face of the balance sheet or income statement, as well as the disclosures, um, that the, the level of detail in that, in those disclosures and balances, um, could be enhanced to, to help. The users make better decisions and better understand what that income tax really consists of and what drives the economics of that income tax expense in particular, what drives that expense item. Um, and I think the larger the entity, the harder it is to really figure out what the heck is going on in that tax expense line. The more jurisdictions that are piling in and kind of flowing through that uh, tax expense line, it really does become difficult to understand. Um, and I think that's true when you start, you know, the more states you add, the more complex it gets. And especially the more international jurisdictions you add, the more complex it gets because the range of tax rates is, you know, it varies kind of wildly. And the nature of how tax works in those jurisdictions, again, varies wildly. So more, more ability to kind of break apart that tax expense was they did get a meaningful amount of feedback that that would enhance the usability of the tax items. I think now coming to the audience here we have today, especially in the smaller business environment, most of our clients, I feel like had a good understanding of what that tax line actually consisted of, just because the level of complexity um, in the number of jurisdictions tends to be a little bit lower. So I was happy to see that the FASB is distinguishing between public and private for at least some of these disclosures. And I am confident that we can figure out a way to make the financial reporting comply with the standard, but also um, make, it, make it useful uh, in the small business environment. Yeah, thanks, Jared, for, for bringing that point up. Um, the, the last kind of section from the new guidance of, as far as the other amendments that are going to go in here are, um, just again, adding some additional disclosures based on how pre-tax income and tax expense, uh, looks from a jurisdictional perspective. And then there is, um, some removal of some disclosures that were not considered relevant any longer. <clears throat> For the uh, rate reconciliations, um, so this this first next couple slides are really going to talk about this from a public business lens, but it's going to be important because even if you're not a public business entity, there is a requirement that you would basically be providing um, the same type of information, just in a more qualitative uh, narrative type of form versus um, the requirement for 
public entities to be showing this in a quantitative tabular format. So I'm going to spend some time and kind of go through what that would look like, just again, to make sure we're illustrating that for the audience here. Um, and then I'll have a reminder at the end about um, what the, the private entities will need to be doing. So for um, public business entities, uh, this will be on an annual basis with the rate reconciliation. They are looking to disclose more specific categories within the rate reconciliation. Again, as Jared mentioned, and I mentioned earlier that trying to kind of break apart the expenses so that users and preparers can have more discrete information about what goes into um, income tax impacts for an entity. Uh, they're looking for additional information on those reconciling items that meet a certain threshold. And so um, I'll get into an example of that in a second, but basically if there's reconciling items that are greater than 5% uh, of you took the pre-tax income multiplied by the statutory rate and there is this one item that in a certain jurisdiction potentially or a certain type of credit that you're getting that's impacting your effective rate, then that would need to be put forward as a reconciling item within uh, the tabular reconciliation. We have, um, there's also descriptions of the state and local jurisdictions that will need to be added um, and explanations for reconciling items if it's not evident from the caption that you're using in the reconciliation, what those are. <clears throat> On the point about what the specific categories look like, this is the, the list that's outlined in the new guidance. So the specific categories that will need to be disclosed are gonna include state and local income taxes, um, net of whatever their, the federal income tax effect would be on those, then there are foreign tax effects, um, enactment of any new laws, uh, cross-border uh, implications, credits, valuation allowances, et cetera. Um, and then to kind of follow up on the specific categories, they're looking that um, within those specific categories, if there's some particular impact, let's say from a tax credit that is again, meeting this 5% threshold that you would essentially need to kind of break that out and show that separately. Um, and they're looking for reconciling items for any of the, within any of those categories to be disaggregated by the nature. So if it's a tax credit, what is that tax credit? Is a new market tax credit or some other type of tax credit you're getting? Um, if there's a reconciling item that meets that 5% threshold that is related to foreign tax effects, then you'll also have to disaggregate those by the jurisdiction or the country uh, where those are happening. Um, and those, again, are just continuing to break apart and show more and more discrete information around what the categories are and the reconciling items that can fall within the categories, assuming that they they meet this threshold. <clears throat> um, as part of the tabular reconciliation for public entities, uh, the FASB is looking for categorization of the reconciling items. And so for items, uh, for reconciling items that fall within state and local categories, um, the income taxes that are imposed at those state or local levels will need to be categorized by the jurisdiction or the country of domicile. Um, foreign tax effects similarly will be need to be looked at from uh, by foreign jurisdiction. Uh, and then the remaining categories would be looking at uh, categorized by the impact of the national income taxes imposed uh, by the different jurisdictions of, that are of the domicile for where those impacts are rising. Um, we've been talking a lot about reconciling items. This is the last slide specifically on that because they are looking for the presentation of those reconciling items on a gross basis. So not with the impact of tax, uh, with the exception of the two items mentioned here, which are unrecognized tax benefits, and also the tax effects of certain cross-border tax laws. Um, the other uh, item that they kind of called out specifically for unrecognized tax benefits is you can disclose the changes for that entire category on an aggregated basis for all jurisdictions. So it's a little bit different than um, breaking apart the 
all the different ins and outs of the different categories earlier. And this is one where you can aggregate by jurisdiction. So there's a lot of uh, new information there. Again, this is related to the, the tabular quantitative format for public business entities. Uh, however, for again, for the other than public business entities, so, so private companies, you will need to consider all of those ins and outs and then be able to provide qualitative disclosures about those same specific categories. So what are the state and local impacts? What are any cross-border tax law effects that you might be dealing with, um, et cetera? And then being able to provide additional information to help, again, the users uh, understand why there are those differences that are arising between the statutory tax rate and the effective tax rate um, at a much more granular level. <clears throat> So that kind of covers the, the new guidance on um, the rate reconciliation within uh, income tax disclosures. This, this next piece is around income taxes paid. And so now there will be a requirement for all entities, uh, whether public or not, to disclose um, the amounts of income taxes paid on a disaggregated basis for federal, state, and foreign taxes um, there is also a requirement for the income taxes paid where they meet a 5% threshold to be shown uh, in a disaggregated nature by jurisdiction. Um, continuing to roll through the, the new disclosures, they are looking for more information on how income from continuing operations before tax, how that gets broken out between domestic and foreign operations, and, and then also the income tax expense that's applied to those, those kind of breakouts to segregated by um, at a federal, state, and foreign level as well. So again, lots of lots of new information. Um, I think the the board thought that they would be helpful and be like, well, we've we've added all this new information, so let's take a, take a few things out to show that we're we're trying to be well balanced. Uh, so they did include in the new guidance the elimination of a couple a couple current requirements. So one of those is around unrecognized tax benefits, and so the requirement that we have on um, what's the range of reasonably possible change for those uh, unrecognized benefits in the next twelve months or making a statement that an estimate cannot be made, that requirement is gonna be going away once this is effective. Uh, the board also decided to eliminate the requirement to show the cumulative amount of each type of temporary difference when it's related to the deferred tax liabilities that are not recognized um, due to exceptions related to deferred taxes for subsidiaries or corporate joint ventures. So those are a few places where hopefully that'll make it easier uh, on the preparer side for what's being included in their financial statements. The effective date for um, for 2309, these improvements to tax disclosures are gonna be beginning after, for annual periods beginning after December 15th, 2024. So a couple of years down the road. And then for all other entities will be annual periods after December 15th, 2025. Um, even though there's, pardon me, even though there's um, kind of sort of significant time between uh, today's presentation and when these will be effective, it'll be important to be kind of planning, I think, thoughtfully um, for financial statement preparers um, ahead of those effective dates to make sure that there's adequate kind of systems and processes in place um, for um, being able to start showing the granu granularity of um, all the new income taxes by jurisdiction and nature, et cetera. It's able to be applied prospectively. Um, so I think that's, again, uh, hopefully will ease some of the transition. Um, but if you wanna ap apply it retrospectively, that is also permitted. Um, so this is, the, this is the end of the, the income tax disclosures. Um, there's a couple more ASUs that have been recently issued to go over, but I think there was, um, I was looking and there was a question about if there were any changes to disclosures if the entity is a flow-through entity. 
And so I think that's a that's a good question, Jared. I would certainly welcome your um, sure your own thoughts. <laughs> I've got mine. So th- there's there's a simple answer to this question. There's and there's a more nuanced yeah. nuance answer to this question. I, so I think the what we are going over today, the the ASU covers. Um, changes to disclosures for income tax. And this is a concept that falls under ASC 740 for income taxes. So a a flow-through entity is not a tax-paying entity. So the simple answer is no, it does not apply to flow-through entities. The more nuanced answer incorporates the concept of the pass-through entity taxes, um, which is relatively newer. Um, And so those are situations where uh, states have enacted a law that allows entities, taxes, partnerships, or other like path-through type structures to pay taxes at the entity level rather than at the individual owner level. So these are commonly referred to as pass-through entity tax or PTE taxes. Um, So to the extent your business as a flow through entity is treating those pass through entity taxes under ASC 740 as an income tax attributable to the entity and not the owner, then it's in scope. To the extent you're treating those pass through entity taxes uh, more like a distribution, uh, it would not be in scope. So um, there are, there is, um, a range of, of conclusions here on how the pass or entity taxes are reported. It varies depending on the jurisdiction and the application of a particular entity and, and their interpretation of that standard. So there, I would expect there'd be some diversity here, but um, the short answer is no, uh, it really doesn't apply to flow through entities because there we wouldn't typically expect to see an expense under 740 mm-hmm. being reported there. Yeah. Exactly what I was going to say. I think the, it's a good good way to sum it up. There's no income tax expense there, then probably not for you. But I think you make a great point on there's there's always nuances, it seems like, when it comes to taxes and how entities are treated and such. So thanks, Jared. And thank you for whoever submitted the question. So moving on from income taxes. Um, so first uh, ASU that was issued uh, for 2024 um, had to do with um, profits, interest, uh, or similar awards. And so this was um, brought up by stakeholders as an area of maybe diversity in practice, an area of confusion um, as companies think about how they are um, basically allowing their um, the payment uh, to customers for, for goods and services and, and or to the compensation of their employees and really determining, or should we be applying ASC 718, uh, which is the share-based payments uh, topic to these types of uh, arrangements, essentially. And so these type of awards that are specifically covered here um, by the FASB or where they wanna provide some illustrative guidance are where there are awards being given, where there's this opportunity to participate in future profits or equity appreciation, so it's a little bit different than kind of a normal share-based payment where there's kind of an existing right to the net assets uh, of the entity. This is more focused on what the profits or appreciation specifically is rather than the, the net asset or the downside there. So um, one interesting point uh, is that they did not come out and define profits interest specifically. Um, I think they they left that just as, hey, here are these type of awards that come out and here's kind of the illustrative guidance with the hope that that um, preparers of financial statements will be able to apply that way. Um, but really the, the point is to differentiate from capital interests, again, where investors are holding rights to existing net assets. <clears throat> so the current guidance right now um, is mentions how there's certain terms, conditions, and characteristics of these type of awards and need to apply judgment to determine uh, what those are. And so what happens in the new guidance is they um, 
go through and say, hey, in order to make sure you're considering these as share-based payments uh, under ASC 718, here's four different kind of like fact patterns um, that you can go through to try and analogize to your own situation. Um, the given had the kind of the length of the four items, um, not showing those here today. Uh, certainly reach out if you have questions to to us and we'll be able to help you out. But kind of on a general, from a general perspective, um, that these share-based payments are where a grantor is is acquiring goods or services and they're either issuing its shares or some type of equity instrument to an employee or a non-employee, uh, and or they are incurring liabilities. Uh, to the same parties where the amounts could be based on kind of the existing price of an entity's shares or may require a settlement by shares. And so the illustrative, um, the, I would say the, the examples that are being put into the new guidance really try to illuminate that if the, that awards in this context are considered share-based payments when the grantor, so the one who is issuing the award, um, is receiving some agreed upon consideration. Uh, so for example, like service conditions are being met, that the grantee, so the one who's receiving the award, um, has the right to participate in some type of residual interest uh, through either distributions or settlements of ownership, um, and that the grantee uh, can receive cash proceeds upon settlement based on the price of the shares of the grantor. And so um, this is hopefully going to eliminate some of the diversity in practice that we're seeing. The I would say the kind of the upshot is as long as, as these awards are really being used to pay someone for something, um, then they should be kind of looking toward ASC 718 as it is a share-based payment. Um, the, from a scope perspective, this would really apply to all, all reporting entities that have these types of awards. And um, the effective period is for public entities will be uh, those, those annual periods after December 5th, beginning after December 15th, 2024, and any interim periods within those, those annual uh, cycles. Uh, for all other entities, it will be for periods beginning after December 15th, 2025. <clears throat> um, the, the next one I wanted to cover, this is the most recent uh, update that was issued, um, deals with the disaggregation of income statement expenses and is applicable to public business entities. Um, so we will we'll keep this relatively short. This is even further down the road where it's not effective for any reporting periods until after the periods after December 15th, 2026. Um, but the, the board has received feedback from you know, investors and lenders, et cetera, on really how to break apart some of the selling and general and administrative expenses. Um, they would find basically more disclosure around specific expense categories very useful to them in understanding the financial performance of a company. And so the new, the new guidance, oh, excuse me, let me move forward yet. Very close to doing that. Uh, but the new guidance um, is going forward and now requiring some basically breaking out from selling or general administrative captions, certain expense categories, which would include things like the purchases of inventory, uh, how much employee compensation is, uh, the amounts of depreciation that are being shown within different categories um, that are already shown there, uh, as well as like intangible asset amortization. Um, the Another piece that is being asked for in the new guidance is to define what selling expenses are and then disclosing the total amount of selling expenses. <clears throat> um, a couple other things to keep in mind here is that when... Um, the specific expense categories are coming out of, let's say, a selling or a GNA expense line item. Um, the there is also a requirement to basically disclose kind of a qualitative description of the amounts that are remaining in those relevant expense captions. Um, again, so if you pulled out 
employee compensation from GNA expense line item, um, describing what else is in in GNA, what's all, what else is being um, kind of running through that caption again to help the help the users understand uh, the financial performance of the business a little bit better. That is um, it for the most recent ASUs that were issued in the, in the last 12 months or so. And so we'll, we'll take a second, I'll pass it back over to Jared yeah. to help us understand the, the ASUs that'll be, uh, are soon to be effective. <laughs> sure, Ben, maybe so a bit of yeah. um, commentary on the last two items you covered, which was the, mm -hmm. the profits interest and the disaggregation on the expense side. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you know we were watching the profit interest development pretty closely as a, at the firm level. Um, we we serve a lot of clients that use the profits interest structure as part of the the compensation arrangements with their employees, um, and and we certainly were aware of some amount of diversity in practice around you know which types of instruments fall under seven eighteen versus seven ten. Um, I think our experience was that substantially all profits interests were falling under 718 prior to this ASU. And sort of this kind of just, you know, it, it was meant to remove some diversity in practice, but I think among our client base and the way our firm have been interpreting the prior standard, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of movement, maybe a little bit around the edges, but not a lot of, of movements in how our clients are going to apply the concept of profit interest, you know, pre and post 24-01. Um, so uh, a clarification, but not probably a meaningful shift in most of what I see. Um, on the expense disaggregation side, uh, you know, when you, the, the feedback I got from a lot of our clients, you know, when I asked, it was kind of like shrug their shoulders and say, okay, more disclosures, you know, not shocking, but do we really need this? Um, I, I feel like upon some reflection of what an outside user sees in the what I what our work product is, which is the audited statements, um, a little bit of disaggregation, a little bit of color around what those expense line items contain, I, I think is fair, right? It, you look at the income statement for a lot of our clients, and there's like you know there's four or five lines to it. You know, especially in the in in the operating expense section, there's not a lot of detail there. Um, now, when the user has direct access to management or is management, um, those details are surely discussed. Uh, but the FASB writes their rules, um, assuming that there's not always access to management to ask those clarifying questions, to get the supporting schedules, to have a direct conversation, you know, with um, the board or with with senior management. And so disclosure in these areas, I do feel like um, makes a lot of sense, especially for the larger the larger businesses. And for the smaller businesses, I'm sure it's things that were discussed and contemplated. Uh, maybe just now some of those sidebar conversations are going to make make their way into the footnote disclosures. Um, so with that, let's talk about some um, upcoming effective ASUs. Uh, so, you know, we are getting close to year-end reporting. We're going to cover some ASUs that will be effective for periods beginning after December 31st, 2023. So uh, we phrase this as the way the FASB does, but, you know, think about uh, December 24 year-ends. Uh, we're going to cover the ASUs impacting all entities and non-public entities alike. Uh, so let's get into the first one here, which is common control arrangements and leases. So this is um, ASU 2301, uh, which amends the reporting for leases under common control. Uh, the ASU um, uh, does address this concept of, of common control, which in you know, basic term uh, means the amendment covers arrangements between related parties or between entities that have common a common parent. So it's a broader conceptual idea um, that the arrangement between these entities uh, or these companies may be made in, in various forms, whether it's um, written or verbal or maybe some combination. The two, our client base is certainly well acquainted with 
um, related party leases and whatnot. So I think this this ASU uh, will be impactful for many of us here today. Um, the FASB did elect to leave you know, this concept of quote common control as a conceptual idea. Uh, it doesn't provide a specific or any sort of rigid definition. Um, and so instead of the board left it up to the discretion of preparers and um, from our perspective as auditors or you know serving in some a test uh, a test role you know, left some judgment in determining what constitutes common control for this purpose. Um, so uh, interpretation of that term can be decided by referring to other top topics. So you know there is other guidance out there. The you know 805 and business combinations uh, discusses common control uh, common control transactions. The SEC staff has other publication on what um, uh, what related party means. Um, so we can kind of use those as benchmarks and then ultimately make our own judgment on how the ASU would be applicable. Uh, so the, the first issue uh, that it covers in the new guidance gives companies the option to use a practical expedient when evaluating the accounting for leases. Uh, by using the written terms of the agreement rather than determining whether the terms and conditions are legally enforceable, which was the standard in the, in the prior guidance. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in applying this practical expedient as it can be used on an arrangement by arrangement basis. So companies don't have to decide to use this practical expedient for all or none. It can be sort of a um, a, an arrangement by arrangement decision. Um, it is only available to entities that are non-public entities. Um, also, it excludes uh, not-for-profit bond obligors and employee benefit plans that file an 11K or, or um, have SEC reporting. Um, I don't think a lot of those 11K reporting entities have <laughs> leases on their balance sheet, but uh, they are nevertheless out of scope here. Um, I do think this is very much welcome relief um, because the, the prior standard set this threshold of applying this legally enforceable concept um, to a lease arrangement, uh, which meant that if a lease is maybe it's super expired, maybe it's verbal, you know, maybe, maybe there are terms that are vague or something, you know, it had to hit this legally enforceable threshold to really be applied to 842. And this kind of simplifies it and said, well, if it's written, then just go with the words as written on the page. So very much welcome um, relief to, I think, many of our clients. Uh, so the second issue here in the ASU, uh, it amends the guidance um, that addresses leasehold improvements. Uh, by requiring amortization of these assets over the useful life of the improvements to the common control group. So you ignore the actual lease term um, when setting that amortization period. Uh, companies should consider if the lessor of the leased asset obtained control rights with someone outside the common control group. And if so, the period of amortization must not exceed um, the common control group's lease term. Um, so the update guidance also prescribes accounting for leasehold improvements as a transfer through equity or net assets when the lease no longer, when the lessee no longer controls the use of the underlying assets. Uh, leased, leasehold improvements should be evaluated for impairment as necessary under 360. So this is, this is sort of a clarification, but not a new concept. Um, so you apply that impairment thought process as we would any other similar lease under ASC 360. Um, so unlike the first issue, um, these new rules are applicable to all entities. Uh, so I think my last set of points um, on this ASU would be that um, the terms and conditions, uh, going back to issue one, the terms and conditions uh, must be written for the practical expedient to be applied. Um, if they remain unwritten, then we still need to apply that existing threshold about legal enforceability. 
So when applying the guidance, companies can um, document previously unwritten terms um, all the way through the date the financial statements are available to be issued to be in compliance with the, this new standard. So even if you trip into January or February of 2025, you can't go back and apply the written lease terms established for the first time, those written lease terms, and then use the practical expedient so long as those that, writ, that write up the written terms and conditions are, are settled and written and agreed to uh, before the financial statements are available to be issued. So that gives us a lot of flexibility in how this is, is applied. Um, regarding what specifically must be documented in writing, there isn't any specific requirements here. Um, so we can use discretion as to you know what gets you know what gets put into the written terms and conditions. However, I would maybe go back to my previous point, which is that if it remains unwritten, anything unwritten needs to pass that legally enforceable threshold for it to be considered. Um, so think about that if you're kind of uh, in the mode of creating for the first time um, a legal um, a legal agreement where previously it was um, a verbal understanding. And then finally, for the leasehold improvements, uh, these must be amortized over the useful life, useful life of the asset applicable to the common control group, even if the lease terms for the specific lease is shorter than that. Right. So we just think about the lease term for the the what might be a higher level of commonly controlled entities, and that drives the amortization period. Um, it's not the lease term that is applicable to the reporting entity necessarily. That's a little bit of um, that's a little bit of an interesting um, concept to be applied uh, for this particular ASU. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate that. Um, so the the other two uh, ASUs that are becoming effective for the upcoming uh, calendar year end reporting entities um, is from back from twenty twenty one. There was a, an ASU issued around contract assets and liabilities, um, and so. <clears throat> The amendments in this update to remind everyone who's here today is, is uh, requiring acquirers, um, so an acquirer of a, in a business combination to recognize and measure contract assets and liabilities uh, in accordance with topic 606. Um, the, a few things that, that kind of <clears throat> come to mind uh, while reading through the ASU is that in many circumstances, uh, an acquirer is acquiring you know, assets and liabilities from an acquiree. And so applying topic 606, um, the now acquirer in the business combination would need to uh, look at the related revenue contracts that they uh, will be getting through that combination and evaluating them as if they had been the originators of that contract. <clears throat> Uh, as part of the ASU, it is allowable for uh, the acquirer and the business combination to use um, the acquiry entities assessment. Uh, and so they can look basically and see how was the acquiree accounting for these type of contracts? Uh, what are the facts and circumstances around that contract uh, for how the acquiree determined what to record and how to record it? Um, and the FASB has kind of noted within the ASU that this may, in many cases, um, allow the acquirer to continue to account for the contract assets and liabilities from contracts with customers in a very similar manner uh, as the acquiree had been doing up until that point. Um, however, they do point out that that might not always be the case. Uh, there may be certain instances where the acquiree was not accounting for those contract assets uh, or liabilities in accordance with top, topic 606 um, already. For instance, they could have been using another uh, accounting standard framework other than US GAAP, um, or as part of the assessment of these uh, revenue contracts, the acquirer may think that there were um, potentially errors in judgment or 
or something that um, to really apply ASC topic 606, they would reach a different conclusion. Um, and so all of those are mentioned within the ASU as, as allowable to look at what the acquiree did, but the acquirer is still the, uh, still the one making kind of the final decision. So <clears throat> from um, a kind of what's, what's in scope when we think about contract assets and liabilities, it's a very, it's very targeted to um, those contracts that would fall under ASC topic 606 specifically. So really only um, the assets and liabilities arising from revenue contracts. Um, it does not impact the accounting for other assets or liabilities that kind of arise from having revenue contracts. So uh, as you think about the business combination guidance, um, the recognition of intangible assets related to, to customers, um, so either getting a customer list or something along those lines, those type of intangible assets uh, would still follow existing, existing guidance for business combinations. Um, uh, the ASU uh, also uh, looks at, at um, when you think of the lens of the now acquiring business entity, looking at uh, revenue contracts um, under ASU topic 606, the, AS, the board has given some practical expedience that can be used. So as it relates to any contracts that were modified before acquisition date, um, the acquiring entity will be able to kind of look at the aggregate effect of all the modifications uh, when thinking about identification of performance obligations or determining what the transaction price is or allocating that transaction price. Uh, so in other words, thinking about it kind of at acquisition date, modifications were made. And so just take all those modifications and think about it now, you don't have to kind of go back uh, retrospectively and, and try to incorporate those and when those modifications were made. <clears throat> um, for any contracts, these are the ones that are not modified or, or just um, had not been modified before. The acquisition date, you can use, um, you are able to like determine the standalone selling price at an acquisition date versus at a contract inception date when you think about um, identifying performance obligations and, and allocating the transaction price to that. So again, not having to kind of go back in the acquiry history of the contract, but determining an acquisition date. Um, and those are the two practical expedients. They are able to be applied um, on an acquisition by acquisition basis. Uh, the the kind of the, the caveat there is that if you decide um, as the acquirer entity that uh, I'm gonna use one of these practical expedients, then you need to basically look at all the revenue contracts within for that same acquisition. Um, you can't kind of like pick and choose different contracts to use. You kind of say, hey, I'm doing this for all revenue contracts with this acquisition. But if you have a second one, you know, another year, then you may decide not to, and that's, that's okay. And that's allowed by the guidance. Um, so as mentioned, these are these are upcoming. Uh, these are for non-public entities. They're going to be effective for the fiscal years beginning after December fifteenth, twenty twenty-three, and they sh it should be applied prospectively um, to any business combinations occurring on or after that effective date. Of the amendment. <clears throat> the the other ASU that is coming effective deals with fair value hedging, um, and so this is back from. 2022, the board was looking to expand um, a kind of hedging method and called the, the lasted layer method where um, it originally was only permitted, uh, entities were only permitted to only one hedge layer uh, to allow multiple hedge layers of a single closed portfolio. And so the lasted layer method is gonna be renamed the portfolio layer method um, you can now apply this to both prepayable or non-prepayable financial assets. So you can get consistent accounting for similar types of hedges. Uh, the new ASU also allows um, for multiple hedge layers to be designated for a single closed portfolio of financial assets. 
Um, the idea again is to hopefully promote consistency among reporting entities on what hedge basis adjustments are applicable to both single layer, a single hedge layer and multiple hedge layers. And I think with that, I don't see any more uh, questions that have come through on the soon to be effective updates. So let's head to the technical agenda for what's what's on the horizon. All right. Is this back to me, Ben? We talk about software costs. Yes, I think that'll All be right. for you to talk about software yeah. costs. So um uh yeah, so on the topic of uh, potentially forthcoming standards, right? So these are things that are in deliberation. Uh, we did pick out a couple things that, um, that I think software costs especially would be maybe the most impactful. Um, so let's, let's jump into, I think that's the next slide where we kind of, yeah, frame up the, the, the technical agenda project on software costs. And this one's going to be specific to internal use software. Uh, we have a huge volume of clients and probably a lot of people on the training today that either is currently capitalizing software that's developed for internal use, or maybe there are earlier stage companies that are at some point in their future going to be capitalizing the costs that uh, they're currently incurring to you know build their own platform. This would be applicable to any sort of SaaS platform that's being built. Um, the board did get a lot of feedback from preparers and users that the current framework for how internal use software is capitalized really kind of just doesn't work anymore. Um, they, they, and basically the current framework uses, um, uses these, uh, these three phases. They use um, what is it, the, the preliminary uh, project stage, the application development stage, and then the post implementation operation stage. And so capitalization really is only available for the most part in that middle stage. Um, uh, but the way software is currently developed, it's not these large, like massive software projects where you have that preliminary project stage, you spend some number of weeks or months or years in development and then, and then roll it out. It's really much more dynamic than that. Uh, and so the concept of like applying this like agile thought process, which is how a lot of software is developed today and uh, software sprints where you're developing smaller pieces of code and then rolling them out um, sort of continuously doesn't really fit into this, into this current model. So the boy, the board did hear this feedback and is proposing some changes to kind of the, of how we think about this stuff. Um, so let's jump ahead. I think it's our next slide, mm -hmm. Ben, where the start to capitalize um, begins when management has authorized the commitment to fund the software and this probable to complete threshold has been achieved. Uh, and that we, we feel like the board feels like that would be applied a lot more easily to these smaller chunks of software that are being developed a lot more quickly. Um, the uh, there is an evaluation as to whether there's significant uncertainty about the probable to complete threshold. Um, so is the thing being developed, is it novel, unique, or somehow unproven? And the entity has determined that it needs, uh, it determined what the software needs to do, right? So there are some parameters around what would be eligible to capitalize. If it's something that is um, yet to be deployed at all, um, you're probably not going to hit this threshold because uh, you know, the unproven functions are probably too significant to get over. But when you have an existing platform and now you're look, you know, you're looking at the Q4 sprints on what the enhancements are going to be, you have a lot more clear path on how you demonstrate the um, the functionality, and you have a, a track record of being able to roll out those enhancements. So kind of better align with how software is being developed in our, in our current you know, economic environment. Um, next, we're gonna talk about a little bit of disclosure. Um, so the amendments would separately require a presentation of cash paid for capitalized internal use software as an investing outflow. Uh, I don't think that's a big change. You know, maybe separate presentation will be the difference here, um, but I think that's how most of our clients would uh, would be doing it under the current model as well. 
Uh, and then let's t move on a little bit to, I think we're, yeah. So mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a scope change on derivatives. Um, so fair disclosure here, I am one of the firm's uh, derivative nerds. So mm -hmm. I've been really kind of interested in following this one. Uh, I do think it's a little bit more narrowly um, targeting how this is going to uh, apply to our clients. Um, so the first issue is um, a derivative scope refinement. So the amendments as proposed would um, be updated to exclude from derivative accounting contracts with underlyings that are based on operations or activities specific to one of the parties of the contract. Um, so the underlying is part of the definition of what is a derivative. It, it has to have an underlying. Uh, that underlying can be tied to the existence or absence of a company's specific thing. It could be operational. It could be profitability of a, of a particular division or the company itself. Um, and all of those financial metrics would sort of be excluded from the, the current or from what would be the future definition of um, the derivative scope. Um, I mean, one, one other thing to note would be contracts with a single underlying that's based on um, a market rate, uh, the price or performance of a financial asset or a financial liability uh, to the contract would not qualify for the proposed scope exception. Um, and maybe one more note on issue two in this uh, agenda item is the scope clarification for share-based payments from customers and revenue contracts. This is more, I think more of a clarification is that um, the, the amendment as proposed would clarify that the entity should apply the guidance in topic 606, uh, which is RevRec, including the guidance for non-cash consideration. Um, and if you're taking notes here, we're talking about paragraphs um, uh, uh, 21 through 24 um, in, the, in that standard. Uh, which apply to contracts with share-based payments. So for example, shares, share options, or other equity linked instruments uh, from a customer that is consideration for the transfer of good or services. Those are all gonna fall cleanly under topic 606. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, I, I feel like that one uh, maybe is most subject to some further clarification as the standard becomes final. Last item on the technical agenda, uh, which was, I think, part of the private company council um, agenda and minutes that have been coming out this year, too, is around hedge accounting improvements. There are five issues that they are looking at. I'm just going to touch very briefly, as I know we're, we're less than five minutes out from, from ending here. Um, but the five issues, the first of the five issues has to do with uh, thinking about risk assessment for cash flow hedges. And so the the agenda with the what the board is looking at doing is expanding the risks that are uh, able to be aggregated into a group of of individual like forecasted transactions when you think about cash flow hedging. Um, and so to do that, they're planning to change the requirement from having shared risk exposure. Uh, of those forecasted transactions to having a similar risk. So it doesn't have to be as exact. It can be um, kind of a little more analogous in order for more, um, more of these different types of transactions being considered for cash flow hedges to be able to get that type of treat treatment. Uh, it would still have to be assessed at inception on an ongoing basis, but the idea is to hopefully allow more things to fall under cash flow hedging. <clears throat> Uh, the second issue uh, is around uh, interest payments on choose your rate debt instruments. So um, the proposal would be to have the contractual terms of the debt agreement are um, the things that determine which alternative rate indexes can be used or tenors uh, when you're thinking about hedging relationships. Um, it would also allow entities to use simplified assumptions when assessing hedge effectiveness and the probability of these forecasted transactions occurring. The third issue deals with cash flow hedges again, but this time for non-financial forecasted transactions. And uh, in these, again, it's an expansion of hedge accounting, hopefully, by um, 
allowing entities to designate variable price components of the forecasted purchase or sale that meet certain clearly and closely related criteria um, within the normal purchases and sales scope exceptions that are kind of that already exist in the hedge accounting guidance. Issue number four um, is to permit compound derivatives composed of written options and a non-option derivative to qualify as a cash flow hedge. Um, this will be done by adjusting the eligibility criteria. So an, ex an example of this would be uh, entering into an interest rate swap with a cap or floor. Uh, and so you're able to um, potentially still designate that as a hedging instrument, even though it will not um, you know, if it's it's capped one or another, will not move exactly uh, in line with the item that it is hedging. And then finally, uh, issue five deals with foreign currency denominated debt um, and uses a hedging instrument and a hedged item. And so there's uh, the proposal to eliminate the recognition and presentation mismatch that you get. So if you're using foreign currency denominated debt instrument as both hedging an instrument and a net investment hedge and also the hedged item and a fair value hedge. Um, you would kind of exclude the fair value hedge basis adjustment from the net investment hedge as you think about uh, assessing its effectiveness and you would immediately recognize earnings and gains and losses there. So again, five very distinct issues for hedge accounting, um, something to kind of keep an eye on as they, they look to uh, finalize comments for those exposure drafts. Um, last slide here is just uh, mainly for awareness. Um, these are items that are kind of within the deliberation process, things around accounting for environmental credits, um, accounting for government grants, some updates for credit losses, and as well as the presentation of contract assets and liabilities for construction contractors. Um, again, these are kind of in early stages of deliberation. No exposure drafts have been made or submitted for public comment, um, but wanted to bring that to this group so you're aware. Uh, depending on how the agenda kind of transforms moving forward. <clears throat> so with that, I think we've we've ended today's session. Jared, thank you so much uh, for taking the lead through all those different sections and, and adding your expertise and view um, as we went through. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thanks.